This is Gene Therapy for Hemophilia, Dream or Reality, a show on behalf of the Canadian Hemophilia Society. Here's your host, David Page. It's a real pleasure to introduce our guest for today's podcast, Dr. Glenn Pierce, physician, a longtime researcher in coagulation products, and current medical vice president of the World Federation of Hemophilia. Today's podcast is entitled, We Don't Know About Hemophilia Gene Therapy. Welcome, Dr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Page. May I call you David? Yes, and we've known each other a long time, Glenn. (laughs) Can I call you Glenn? (laughs) Yes. Uh, In previous podcasts, Glenn, uh, guests have described what we know about gene therapy. But you are famous in the community around the world for your talks and and writing about what you call the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. So let's start with your thoughts on what we know that we don't know about gene therapy's efficacy? Well, what we don't know could fill a book, uh, and what we know could fill a magazine. Perhaps that's a good way of describing it. Um, And the reason for that is that gene therapy... (coughs) And the reason for that is that gene therapy is a new therapeutic modality. It's It's a new approach toward treating a disease. Uh, And whenever you've got a new or novel approach, uh, you know far less about it than than you do for existing therapeutic approaches, small molecules, proteins, monoclonal antibodies. But there were times when we knew almost nothing about proteins back in the 70s and 80s when the first recombinant DNA-produced proteins were being made. And there were times when we knew almost nothing about monoclonal antibodies. They were first published in 1987. And so uh, it's remarkable that they are such a force within the armamentarium of drug products today. But we need to remember just 50, less than 50 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, we didn't know much about them. And so that's the situation with gene therapy, except for the fact that it's a far more complex therapeutic modality than a protein or a monoclonal antibody. Viruses are living organisms, and they're used to deliver the genes. Now, some may argue with that and say viruses aren't. And philosophically, uh, there's a whole debate going on in the literature about whether a virus is a living organism or whether it's simply a collection of amino acids that then take over the cell's machinery in order to replicate itself. Regardless, though, they're very complex. They're much more complex than proteins or monoclonal antibodies. And that's why we know so little about them. For, for people with hemophilia who may be thinking about taking gene therapy, what are some of the specific things that we, we can't know, we don't know, or we can't predict? Well, the biggest is, is the immune response that we make to viruses. And so the virus that we're dealing with that is most commonly used for gene therapy today is called adeno-associated virus, AAV. And it's been known for about 50 years uh, when it was first dis- since it was first discovered. Uh, and this is a very small virus that doesn't cause disease in us. Uh, at least we don't think it causes disease in us. Uh, but what it can do is that it can deliver genes uh, that um, could correct the disease. And so we can take out the existing genes within the virus, there's only two of them, and we can put our gene of interest in, like a factor eight gene or a factor nine gene. But the virus coat remains the same. And that virus coat is immunogenic. There's thousands and thousands of viruses out there. <clears throat> Their goal is to infect us and replicate themselves. And if they kill the host, they kill the host. Their job is to replicate and move on to the next host. And they've been working at this in vertebrate animals for a half a billion years. Our job as a vertebrate animal, of which we are the pinnacle, is to prevent that from happening, to safeguard against the virus, to prevent the virus from getting a foothold, and if it does get a foothold, to destroy it before it destroys us. That's the yin and yang behind viruses and human beings, or any animal for that matter. And so 
we're using a virus as a therapeutic. Well, how do we how do we control our immune response to that virus? And that's the big question. We don't fully understand by any stretch of the imagination the extent of the immune response and the immune response to AAV differs among us. And so for some individuals, it can be a strong immune response. For other individuals, it can be a very small immune response. But that dictates how successful the gene therapy is as well, as well as all the toxicity that may be associated with it. So, so then if you have a strong immune response, does that risk negating the therapy or, or, or getting a very low level of, of, of factor eight or nine expression? Yes. Every new therapeutic that comes along in hemophilia, and we really have been fortunate to see a lot for hemophilia in the last 50 to 60 years, but every single one has a risk and a benefit associated with it. And that's how you break it down. That's how one analyzes it. What is the benefit? Well, the benefit is treatment potentially a cure when we're talking about gene therapy. What's the risk? Well, that's what needs to be defined. And, and so we know what the risks are for recombinant clotting factors. There is a risk of developing an antibody to it that could uh, prevent you from taking it again. That's an inhibitor. We know the risks of plasma-derived products. The earlier risks, which were infectious disease risks from blood-borne viruses that were carried in the plasma-derived products, those are gone now, but the risks of allergic reaction can remain from a plasma-derived product. They're very rare, and it's essentially as safe as a recombinant product. But these are all risks that have been well-defined, well-studied, both in clinical trials as well as in the real world. We don't have that many patients treated with gene therapy, probably under 400 for all of the different hemophilia gene therapies that have been tried in the last 25 years. And as a result, we don't have a great experience to fully understand what the benefit-risk ratio is. There's one other difference with gene therapy. With every other drug that we take, you can stop the drug. The drug will go away out of your system. It may take an hour, may take a day, may take a week or a month, but it goes away out of your system. With gene therapy, it never goes away from your system. You're putting in genetic material into a human being or an animal, and that genetic material will remain there for the rest of that person's life. And so that's a big difference, and it alters the benefit and the risk of gene therapy because we don't know what the long-term risks are. What is the risk after 10 years, 20 years, 30 or 40 years? We don't know because we don't have enough patients that have gone out 10 years, let alone anything beyond that. And so, therefore, we're dealing with a lot of unknown risks. We can't quantify the risks. So we don't know why some people have little or no expression or have variable expression in terms of factor eight or non-activity. We don't know, do we, why factor levels may decline, especially in hemophilia A, a year over year. And I guess we don't know, do we, how long this expression will last. Are those some of the, known, I guess, known unknowns? They are. And so we at least can ask some questions and know what the unknowns are, uh, know that they can't yet be answered. Um, the bigger risk is the unknown unknowns. And, and there, those, we can't even anticipate what the risks might be. They'll surprise us along the way. These are long-term uh, impacts, long-term uh, adverse events. They are. They're long-term. They could even be acute. If we've only had a few hundred patients studied, um, we don't know once you put this into 10,000 patients, what rare adverse events or rare toxicities will occur. And so that's all part of gathering the data, gathering the information, just as we did for recombinant proteins, recombinant clotting factors, just as we have for monoclonal antibodies. It takes, it takes numbers and time in order to fully appreciate the benefits and the risks. Meanwhile, these products are, are being improved. And, and are being used. Well, they are. And it's, it's important to distinguish between hemophilia B and hemophilia A. 
And we shouldn't lump all of hemophilia gene therapy together. That would be a mistake. How are they different? Yeah, the reason is based upon the data from the phase three clinical trials, as well as ancillary data from phase one, two clinical trials. But the phase three trials for hemophilia B had 54 patients in the phase three trial for the drug that's approved. And for hemophilia A, it had 134 patients uh, for the drug that's approved. And so that's a reasonably high number of patients in both cases to begin to understand what the benefits and the risks are. For hemophilia B, if we look at this phase three trial, plus if we look at a number of predecessor trials that have been running since 2010 with essentially the same, the same drug, it's got some differences along the way, but it's basically the same drug. Um, the safety profile is excellent, uh, and the, the benefits are good. Uh, they appear to last for a long period of time. We don't know how long. Um, the company making the drug uh, has calculated out through statistical analysis at least 25 years. What I look at is I look at the, at the result. So I look at the percentage of factor IX activity for a patient over time. And what I see for hemophilia B in all of the trials that have been run is a horizontal line. That's a line that has a slope of zero. It's flat. And so while 25 years may be calculated, I don't see, I don't see the line going down at all in the, in the shorter period of time that we've been looking at this. So that's good. That, the, that means that the it's great. factor yeah. nine expression is steady and, 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 not, and not, not, not declining. It does. I, you know, I, I think that we can't fully predict that it's going to be steady for the rest of a person's life, but um, it looks pretty good. So in, there, in are more, uh, there are more unknowns with hemophilia A, with, with, with its durability. There are. Um, what we know from hemophilia A is that the expression level goes down in many patients. In the phase one, two, 13 patients, it went down in every single patient year over year. In the phase three trial with 134 patients, we haven't seen all the data broken down quite that way, but it does look as if it's declining year over year if you look at the group averages. Um, but we also know that some patients are remaining steady um, but if the group averages are all declining, that means that many patients are declining. We know that some patients have had to go back on prophylaxis after three or four years. Well, that's, um, that's all factored into the benefit and risk. So what kind of a benefit do you get and what is the risk? The benefit with factor nine uh, is that you are going to have long-term stable levels of factor nine. You don't know how much you're going to get. You can't predict that in advance. It could be 10%. It could be 80%. That's not predictable. But whatever it turns out to be, they're going to be pretty stable levels. For factor eight, you can't predict. And so you will, you, you may get something close to 5% or 3% or even zero. Uh, that's occurred in some patients, or you may get a much higher level and see it go down. Uh, but that's not that's not predictable. So then you balance that off against the risk. The risk for factor nine during the during the first year, I think about seventeen percent of the patients needed to take steroids, and they took the steroids for an average of about two and a half months. So that's not so bad. And, and if it helped quiet down the immune response, then, uh, then it's, it's worth it. For factor VIII, uh, patients needed to take steroids for eight months on average. Uh, and it, didn't, uh, it caused a lot of side effects. It caused a lot of toxicity. It's not clear they needed to take the steroids for that long, but that's how the trial was designed. And so you've got those short-term risks, and then both products have a long-term risk, and that's those unknowns. That's what has to be balanced off against factor eight and factor nine gene therapy. So, so Glenn, the hemophilia community was horribly affected by viral infections from the first generation of clotting factor concentrates way back in the 
in the 70s and, and the 80s. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> what lessons from that from that time do we need to remember? That there are unintended consequences of new technologies. That's really what we need to remember. I was there. I was on the front lines. I began taking plasma-derived clotting factor concentrates. They were a miracle. They truly, they allowed me to go to medical school, to get educated, to begin living a life that really was confined to a wheelchair when I was 12 years old. So, yeah, that was a miracle. But what the unintended consequence was is that it transmitted HIV, HBV, and HCV to me. And so, uh, yeah, welcome to the miracle. It saved my life, perhaps, but it gave me diseases that killed many of my friends uh, along the way and may yet kill me. Those are the unintended consequences of new technology. We didn't understand that at the time. And that's the problem with new technology. We think we understand, but we don't. We really don't. And it's only when the experience shows um, over a period of years with a lot of patients treated what the actual benefits and risks are. For all those viral infections, we started using concentrates on a widespread basis in the late 1960s, early 1970s. By 1972, Carol Casper, one of the mothers of modern hemophilia treatment, was reporting hepatitis in her patients. By 1978, Pierre Minucci, also one of the fathers of hemophilia treatment, reported biopsies of patients who had cirrhosis. 1978, HIV didn't appear on the scene until 1982. We ignored all of these warning signs that these viruses could be transmitted until a truly lethal one came into being, and then we got serious about trying to get rid of them. And so my concern is that we just need to proceed cautiously. We need to look at the benefits and the risks. A benefit of gene therapy in my mind, since I was 10 years old, has been to cure hemophilia. I didn't know it was gene therapy at the time. I just wanted to cure hemophilia. And so that's a benefit worth taking. The risk, though, is that if you don't have a benefit that cures your disease, then you're taking a risk that is um, um, changes the balance between benefit and risk. So that's what each patient needs to figure out through informed decision-making, through shared decision-making. In the face of these many unknowns, how do you answer the question? That's the, the title of this uh, podcast series, Hemophilia Gene Therapy, Dream, or Reality? Well, once again, separating out heme B from heme A, I think each individual needs to ask and answer the question. For heme B, let's take heme B as, an, as our first example. You know what the products are that are available, extended half-life products that can be administered intravenously every one to perhaps two weeks for some patients. And that gives you reasonable, reasonable levels of clotting factor that prevent most breakthrough bleeding. So that has allowed patients to do all kinds of things, including climb Mount Everest. And so that's just a terrific advance in the treatment of hemophilia. Balance that out against gene therapy, which may allow you to just forget that you had hemophilia for a prolonged period of time, measured in many years, maybe decades. Well, so you as an individual patient just need to decide, do I want to continue on the path I'm on or do I want to try something different that's going to change my path and how I think about my hemophilia and perhaps give me what uh, Cedric Hermans and I have called a hemophilia-free mind. I have a hemophilia-free mind because I had a liver transplant 15 years ago, and my hemophilia has been cured. It's truly a wonderful, miraculous experience. My joints are in terrible shape, so I am reminded I have hemophilia, but basically it's a hemophilia-free mind. I know I'm not going to bleed again. That's hemophilia B. For hemophilia A, that balance changes a little bit because you're going to take a product that may give you a good result or a decent result, but it won't last perhaps for very long, five years, seven years, 10 years maybe. 
and then you'll have to go back to whatever your other therapy was. Well, is that worth the risk of the unknown uh, and the risk of toxicity in the first year? That's a decision that only individual patients can make. Am I happy with what I've got, or do I want to try something different? And the current treatment is different, too, for hemophilia A. Well, that's an excellent point, David. We don't have an emicizumab or a bispecific antibody for hemophilia B. We just have intravenous treatment. Now, there are products in the pipeline that are coming along that are basically universal rebalancing agents that change the the pro and anticoagulant activity. So in a person with hemophilia, you don't have enough procoagulant activity. Well, if you dampen down the anticoagulant activity, the thing that puts the brakes on coagulation, then you'll have a better clotting, better better um, better clot formation, and so that would be that'll be available to hemophilia B in a few different forms, um, probably over these next few years, and so that will change the equation a bit for hemophilia B and maybe turn it a little bit more into hemophilia A. So they may be worth waiting for. Well, they may, but. You also balance that out against knowing that you're likely to get a decent result with gene therapy for hemophilia B with, without too much risk in the first year. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, before we end, is there anything else you'd like uh, our listeners to know about the, the knowns, unknowns, the unknown unknowns, etc.? Well, with each passing year, the technology gets more and more complicated. I have been learning so much over these years Uh, And I've continued to push myself to stay on the cutting edge of these new technologies. But they're complicated. A lot of molecular biology, a lot of sophisticated technology that didn't exist when I went through all of my training uh, during my PhD phase of my work. And so um, we all have an obligation to learn as much as we can uh, and to educate ourselves as best we can. And we do that for two reasons. One, to make an informed decision. And the other is to work with our health care providers, our loved ones, our families, to make shared decisions. So uh, I'm not in a vacuum here. I need to discuss any major treatment decisions I make with my family uh, and, of course, with my health care providers and come up with a reasonable solution that's personalized for me. And as these technologies get more and more complicated, we have to work harder and harder to understand them. Well, thanks, Glenn, uh, for doing this podcast and for all your work over many decades in the hemophilia bleeding disorders community. It's a pleasure talking with you, Dave. Thank you for inviting me. For more information on gene therapy, we invite you to check out other podcasts in the series Hemophilia Gene Therapy, Dream or Reality, including one called What Other Approaches to Gene Therapy Are Down the Road, uh, in which Dr. Glenn Pierce returns to explore what the next generations of gene therapy in hemophilia A and B might look like. And that's exciting, too. It is. For more information, we invite you to check out more episodes in this series, Hemophilia Gene Therapy, Dream or Reality. This podcast series was made possible by an unrestricted educational grant from Pfizer Canada to the Canadian Hemophilia Society.